Hey everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. On behalf of uh, myself, I'm John Preston, the Dean of the College of Computing and Software Engineering. And on behalf of Kennesaw State University, also, also. Uh, Dean Vensa Wilmot, the Dean of the College of Science and Mathematics, and Dean Sheremy, Dean of the Coles College of Business. I want to welcome you to the third of a series of four invited lecture series that BlackRock has been kind enough to, to join us on. Uh, really excited tonight to, to be diving deep into cybersecurity and the computing system side of BlackRock's operations. I know we've got an exciting panel and uh, I'll turn it over to Lucas Pilgrim to, to introduce everyone on that. But before we get to that, I uh, want to uh, acknowledge our MCs from the College of Computing tonight, Dr. Ying Ji, who is a professor and also the director of the Equifax Data Science Research Lab here at Kennesaw State University. Uh, Dr. Ji has been in the college for a number of years and holds multiple patents and has a significant research portfolio that he manages. Also, we have our uh, student representative, David Blunk. David's a senior in information technology and uh, is currently co oping at GTRI and has also done uh, C2MA and Cypher doing blue and red team operations. So, a lot of security background there for David. So, David and Ying will be emceeing the, the Q&A portion. I want to remind everyone that we are recording tonight for the, the benefit of those who couldn't be with us in real time. And so again, I want to thank everybody for being here. And Lucas, I'll turn it over to you to introduce your team and then dive into the, the details. Perfect. Well, thank you, Dean. Uh, we're excited to be here. Uh, welcome everybody back to the, the, the BlackRock KSU Speaker Series. Uh, as Dean Preston mentioned, my name is Lucas Pilgrim. I am a, a proud KSU alumni, so we're excited about this partnership, excited for both what, what BlackRock is doing here in Atlanta and what, what KSU is doing both um, just north of the city here in Atlanta. Well, I hope everybody was able to join us for our previous two sessions where we kind of at a high level in our first session and kind of talked about what I wish I knew as an undergrad. And we had a, a panel of BlackRock employees kind of speak to entering the workforce, preparing their resumes, things that they were kind of encountering as, as they transitioned from, from university to the workforce. That was a great session. And then our second session, where we heard from Cheyenne Hussein, where he provided context on, on what it means and what he does as a portfolio manager, and also provide us with kind of an outlook on current markets. So two great sessions there. We hope you, you you're able to join us for both of those. But today we're excited to kind of take it to another lens, where we kind of talk specifically about fintech and cyber and IT and how that impacts the workforce and what BlackRock is doing kind of building for the future and how they're, how KSU is preparing students to kind of transition to, to the workforce there. We're, proud, we're kind of proud of our, our partnership that's growing with, with KSU and speaker series. This is one piece of, of, of many more opportunities to come. I think once once campus is open and we're back in our office, there could be some some future opportunities for for face to face interaction and where where our employees and our team gets an opportunity to meet the students. Um, at, a black, at BlackRock, kind of at a high level, is introducing the firm for for those that are not familiar. Um, we're we're an organization that manages money for organiz other organizations around the world. And while money management is really generally associated with, with portfolios and transactions and and kind of the movement of money, there's hundreds and thousands of employees at BlackRock that do the things such as protecting client data, building a global brand, maintain, maintaining client relationships, uh, reporting out on performance and transactions. Um, building a strong culture, the, the hiring and the HR function and the accounting functions and the building operations functions, which building operations kind of more important than ever as we're preparing to move into back into the office, having that safe, clean workspace where everybody feels comfortable is a critical piece. While we have um, over 16,000 employees, local relationships are really critical to our success and, and it kind of start building relationships with students and building relationships with the universities that, that our offices are located at around the world. And that's kind of a, enough at the BlackRock level, but I know we're excited to kind of hear from, from Hope, Ashima, and, and Adam as they kind of give us an overview of their, their roles and responsibilities, their transition to 
for Workspace, um, their day-to-day -day and some things that they're kind of working on. Thank you again for everybody joining us today. Um, Dean, thank you for, for having us and the KSU team. And uh, with that, I will pass it to Hope as she gives us kind of an overview of, of her role at BlackRock and kind of kicks off her panel. Awesome, thank you so much for the warm introduction, Lucas. Uh, so hi, my name is Hope Diamond, name but a real name. Um, I work in BlackRock in the analytics uh, side of the business. And um, my role is very much firmly at the, uh, the cross point of fin and tech. Uh, so specifically what my team does is we build quality control models to uh, detect anomalies in intraday risk data. And we do that using machine learning um, and uh, big data and data science to be able to detect those anomalies. Um, I love my job because I, every day I get to build new models and test new things out uh, to find problems that people haven't detected before and improve our data quality across the firm. And I'm sure you can imagine the investment decisions that we make, that our managers make, um, are only as good as the, the, the data that they have. So my job is very, very critical to the functioning of BlackRock, uh, to our reputation, and to delivering the best results for our clients. Um, so that's a little bit about uh, me and um, where I sit within the fintech world. And with that, I'll hand it over to Ashima. Hey guys, I'm Ashima Chakravarti. Uh, I am a platform services manager at BlackRock. So what that means is, uh, like how Lucas was saying, that we uh, manage portfolios and we manage people's money and make the investments for them. We similarly provide a platform to do the same to our clients, like which is more than 75 institutions across the world. So they rely on our technology uh, in making their investment decisions. And our uh, we have a uni unified fintech platform for that, which is called Aladdin. So my role is to make sure that Aladdin, which is our uh, suite of tools, is always up and running for our clients as well as for BlackRock. So, and it is a FinTech role because uh, I need to understand what the finance business process is so that I can support my clients. But at the same time, I need to also work with the technology folks, which is uh, the infrastructure side of things, networks, database operations, and work closely with Hope's team as well as the other developers in the firm to figure out, uh, you know, how to keep the service always up and running. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I'll hand it over to Adam now. Thanks, Ashima. Hey, everyone. I'm Adam. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, so as Ashima mentioned, we have this platform called Aladdin, and I also work within uh, that part of the business. Our larger team is responsible for a couple of applications in Aladdin, and, and we'll touch on it more later. Um, we're responsible for building these applications. Um, my particular role is to use uh, data science and machine learning to um, number one, like in, automate a lot of processes and give a better client, give our users and clients a better experience and also internally um, make things more efficient. And we also use the like data science side of things to extract it, like more insight and create better tools ultimately for our clients. Great, thank you. Thank you for the introductions. Welcome. We're very glad that you're here. I'll turn it over now to Ying Ji. I think you're going to MC from here. So, Dr. Ji. Thank you, Dean Preston. Uh, thank you, all the panelists. Uh, so, I uh, really appreciate you joining us, uh, spend time being with us. Um, as we all know, that uh, BlackRock is a financial giant, uh, the world's largest uh, asset manager, right? Uh, but maybe uh, it's the first time for us to know uh, BlackRock is also a very successful technology company. Uh, so you developed Aladdin, right? Um, the so-called operating system for uh, asset manage management. Uh, uh, as far as I know, you not only use Aladdin uh, for your own business, but also license it to other financial firms. Would you please provide an overview of Aladdin, uh, this uh, financial platform? I can uh, take that since I a little bit touched upon it already. 
Um, so you rightly said Aladdin is like our operating system, but it is also our ethos. It has tools, methodology, as well as technology to su support all the business processes uh, as a part of the investment lifecycle for our clients, as well as for BlackRock. Um, yeah. So uh, what what happens is it has a lot of tools. Uh, you can actually think of Aladdin as your smartphone and uh, it has a suite of applications which we called as an Alad as a genie toolbar. You can consider that as an app store. So, and there are various people across uh, across the firms who use applications uh, like we download applications from an app store to perform their operation. So that is why that is how Aladdin is uh, part of part of the technology. So, um, does that answer your question? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so you mentioned Aladdin is kind of like a smartphone. So I believe uh, everybody here uh, uh, in the panel actually use a smartphone, right? So uh, would each of you share a little bit of how you interact with Aladdin for your daily business? Sure. So um, uh, like I said, Aladdin is, um, is, has multiple op applications within it. It has more than 100 applications. So um, we, so my role, uh, I'm not a, not a uh, trader who use the whole investment life. I closely work with the traders who use the whole investment life cycles and the tools that are used to, you know, enter the trade and execute the trades, place them out in the market, get the fills back as well as compliance checks, which is part of the trading life cycle. So I work with the I work with the traders when they use these applications. So they um, if there are any anomalies or if they see any issues, they come back to my team to uh, figure out what the problem is and then I work with the developers to resolve those problems for, uh, for them. So that is how I use some of those tools. But there are other tools as well uh, in Aladdin which are our op HR operational tools or the tools which give us all the training and academy, uh, academia. So all of that is also handled within Aladdin for us. So all our day-to-day -day operations are actually part of Aladdin. I see. Uh, Hope and Adam, do you guys want to add anything onto that? Sure, I can talk a little bit about some of the ways that I use the different Aladdin applications. Um, so I told you a little bit about how I work with analytics and I also work with uh, quality control of data. Um, so some of the typical tools that I'll use, one of them is called Answer and what it does is it helps me um, plug in different inputs to calculate risks for different securities. So let's say we're looking at an asset-backed security. Um, I can play around with different prices and different prepayment rates um, to understand the interest rate risk of that asset. Um, it helps me understand what's going on, what might be wrong, and what's happening in the market um, right now. Um, I also am an avid user of portfolio risk tools, which is a way to look at the exposures. So from a sector perspective, from a country perspective, um, even from who's going to win uh, the 2020 election, we can model that and we can look at the impact of the risk and I can dig into those exposures um, and help inform our investors. I see. So you mentioned a risk, right? So I believe a lot of factors will uh, affect the risk exposure of the assets uh, BlackRock uh, manages, right? So I just wonder uh, how BlackRock uh, leverage modern data technologies. I think you already mentioned uh, something of uh, some of that, like machine learning, uh, data visualization, natural language processions to uh, make and implement uh, investment decisions. Yeah, absolutely, Professor. If you can dream it, we're doing it. So uh, some of the pretty cool projects that uh, we've gotten to work on are um, using natural processors to scrape um, the tweets of a certain politician to understand where uh, market events might be going and how people might react to those. Uh, we also use, uh, I use uh, data science models um, to group like securities that I expect to move together like, uh, like a pool of fish um, to understand why one fish might be going out of that pool and why that might be and using big data and, and machine learning to, to make those groupings and see how they move together. Um, anything you can imagine in terms of uh, how are we going to model this Bitcoin future um, and how can I determine whether its risk is accurate. Um, if you have a creative solution, uh, there's someone that's willing to listen to you to give you the resources to try out that idea. I see, I see. Wonderful. It's very good. If I could add um, sure. one more project that came to mind is um, I know of also like a quite a big legal, in terms of risk, it's more on the legal risk 
of using NLP and character recognition to automatically look through all the like the paperwork and uh, look for any anomalies there if anyone has missed a signature or anything like that. There's also that element of risk. I just want to follow up. Uh, you mentioned an NLP, a national language processor. So is that part of a learning uh, or just separate uh, tools that you use? I can probably answer that. So yeah, so uh, when we say part of Aladdin, I guess, you know, to Ashima's point, it's our operating system. Everything we do is on Aladdin. So we have different platforms, uh, you know, like all, you know, my coder friends that might be attending this, you know, you would think of um, your different um, like code editing platforms that you might use. And we have different tools that are in-house that help us run natural language processing um, systems. Um, we also have our own what we call um, operation analytics lab, which is a uh, data science model creator. Um, so you can pick from like a couple like really standard models. You can plug in your data set and you can use it to help detect trends and see predictive variables that you might not have seen before. And anybody can use this. It's not just you know, hey, I'm working on this project um, and I need to build a model to quality control some risk. It could just be, um, hey, I'm a member of HR and I have some data and I think that there might, you know, be uh, some variables here uh, that are potentially correlated. Let me take a look. Um, so that's one of the really cool things about working at BlackRock is that no matter where you are in the firm, everyone is a technologist and we all use technology to make our jobs easier. And particularly uh, machine learning, natural language processing, it's become more and more common for people all over the firm, um, like the panelists, uh, you know, in addition to myself that are using those tools. Wonderful. So you mentioned that everyone in BlackRock is tech technologist. So, wow, that's, I saw that everybody, everybody's cheater, <laughs> so actually, <laughs> that's good to know, <laughs> actually. So uh, I want to ask uh, um, roughly how many um, technologists are actually dedicated for uh, technology development in BlackRock? Oh, I don't have that number on hand. I'm not sure if any of the panelists, if you do, that would be a great question for Peter. Um, I can absolutely yeah, I, get that for you if no one has it. Sure, sure, sure. I, I'm, I mean, I think we could say that the uh, over 2,000 software engineers. Wow. I don't know if that's, I don't, I, I'm pretty sure, I'm 99% sure that's. that's <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't hold us to it. I could definitely get you an exact number, but that sounds about right. And then it, when you it's count. Some, it's somewhere around there. Yeah, and then when you add on citizen developers, like technically I'm not a, I mean, I mean I'm not a software developer. I don't work with software, but when you, take our maybe like 2000 plus software developers and you add on citizen developers or folks that are just automating and using pretty cool models to do their job. It's it's a pretty substantial number. I see, I see. Yeah, um, so to, uh, uh, I was just saying that uh, the number that Adam said is the 2000 uh, people who are 100% developers, like 100% technologists. But apart from that, the other 13,000 are also using technology in some or the other form. I see. Wonderful. So a related question for our audience. Um, um, I believe most of our audience actually are from College of Computing and the Software, software Engineering. Uh, I know some of them actually would like to have a career in FinTech space. So uh, would you tell us, you know, what type of skill sets is needed uh, to be succeeding in BlackRock? I think we can all probably answer that. So I'll start and then I'll hand to Ashima and then um, to Adam. Uh, so the first foremost, before we get into any like actual like technical skills is natural curiosity. Um, there's no, I wouldn't want anyone on my team and uh, you'd have a hard time succeeding at BlackRock if you're just n not naturally curious about asking yourself, why is this happening? Um, or why does this work this way? Or why are you doing it this way? Um, I think that questioning things is is just absolutely essential. And I'm sure, you know, you would say as well from a computing perspective, you just have to ask not why am I trying to do this, but what could go wrong? That's so much of my job, I'm sure, and yours too. But um, so that's the first, you know, first and foremost. Um, and then next, uh, definitely Python. I think that's the way that the industry is going. So having Python on your resume is really strong. SQL, Unix, Perl are all pluses, but definitely if you have Python um, and you, you know, 
make a point of, you know, like learning what's going on in the financial industry, I think that you would be a great fit on a lot of different teams at BlackRock. And I'll hand over to Ashima. Sure. Uh, I totally uh, agree to the curiosity point. Like we, uh, we are, when we hire, we, when we go out to hire, we are actually looking for people who are smart and open to learn, like not sticking to a particular technology. But having said that, we also, uh, leverage multiple technologies like from Python to Java, Spring, Hibernate, Cassandra, Hadoop, and whatnot. It is also important to understand that we we don't adopt new technologies just for the sake of adapting it because it's it's you know it's cool. Uh, we actually we actually use them to solve actual business problems. And to give you an example, when uh, BlackRock started trading on equities, we realized that our uh, standard uh, you know the, the standard database operations that we were using at that time uh, was not scalable enough or was not uh, fast enough and could not adapt to equity uh, equities and that is why we started using Cassandra. So we use the technology which suits our business needs and um, and that is why our technologies that we use within the firm are keep uh, they keep changing as well as they are like they, we use a huge variety of technology within BlackRock across the 100 plus tools that we have. I see. So I mean, all right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, I think you've, the two of you have covered a lot. I, I'll just add, um, I mean, yeah, I think if you do, you know, if you're a, a, a great uh, Python programmer and now you need, like, I have, I have no doubt that you'll be able to learn Scala or whatever's needed. Um, so it's more about doing what you do well. And like the others said, just always, yeah, if anyone here thinks when you finish college, you, you don't need to learn anymore, I've got, I've got bad news. The learning never stops. Like that's the important part. Yeah, uh, I appreciate uh, uh, what you uh, mentioned. So actually in our college, we teach Python definitely. We teach uh, Hadoop, we teach uh, Cassandra, we teach uh, big data analytics, uh, you know. I believe our students are pretty much ready, you know, for FinTech uh, career. So the uh, uh, following up question is, uh, does BlackRock uh, hire new grads or interns now or in the near future? I can definitely take that one. And the answer is yes. And that's why we're here in Atlanta is because we're looking for students like yours uh, and we're looking for students with those types of skills and natural curiosity. So when BlackRock came to Atlanta, um, the, the biggest driver of that decision, we were New York had a quartered firm um, and I came down from, I was in Princeton uh, previous to Atlanta, but the reason why I'm here and my team is here and I think we're all here is because Atlanta's talent pool is so great. So yes, we really wanted a Southeast presence and we wanted to be closer to a lot of our top clients, um, but there's a major tech hub here and I think that definitely your students have a lot to offer and we have great internship programs. My team had three interns last year. I loved all of them. Um, they were able to actually work on real projects. Uh, like to just like give you an example of something that we had an intern do that you probably wouldn't get to do at other firms is we had an intern work on building like a model for quality controlling options. And this was someone who had was an engineer had no financial experience and I just said let's just like understand why would you buy this like how do you make money off of this and now let's talk about the the computing and like let's automate it now that you understand how to make money off of it how do you automate it um so they got to contribute to the work of our team in a really really big way um and that's definitely um there are great programs offered at the Atlanta office and for new grads and um like juniors junior seeking internships that is actually the best part of interning at BlackRock, that we don't uh, just let people intern at BlackRock so that they could learn. We we let people intern at BlackRock so that we could also gain something out of it. So they work on actual business problems with the actual engineers and technologists so that both of them can gain, gain out of the process. Yeah, definitely it's great to know that uh, you are hiring, right? So I guess, um, I will leave the detailed questions for uh, for our audience uh, to ask. Uh, so now, uh, since you mentioned Atlanta, as we know that uh, Atlanta has a plan actually to become the world capital of a fintech. Uh, right now, 70% um, of the transactions at the global level actually pass through the state of Georgia. So I just wonder now you come to, as a, as a significant fintech company, you come to Atlanta now. Uh, so uh, what, impact, what type of impact that BlackRock may have on FinTech in Atlanta? 
I can probably right. start uh, to oh, uh, go for it, Adam. Okay. Cool. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's important to note uh, that Atlanta is very heavy on the payments and transaction side, like you mentioned, um, that statistic. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people, when they think of fintech, it's like consumer fintech. So maybe like a, Ven a Venmo or PayPal or something like that. And we're in a very, very different space where it's, you know, our, our product is not meant for um, millions of consumers. It's meant for the, some of the largest institutions in the world. So in terms of what we can bring, I think it's very, a very different part of FinTech to what already exists in, in the city. And I would just add on to that, that um, we're currently, I think, um, Lucas, perhaps correct me if you know, I think we're at 300 employees and our goal is to get up to 1,000 here in Atlanta. Wow. Uh, so we're definitely very committed um, to hiring here and hiring local talent. Wow, 1,000. Wow, that's that's good. Mm -hmm. to and, and yeah, and a, and, a, and a big chunk of that recent growth. Oh, wow, that's good. No, it's good news for our college, actually. So. <laughs> Um, it's, so, it's good news for your college, but I feel very old at 29 uh, at, in our office because it's a very, very young office. So uh, definitely that's that's a plus for sure. Wow. It's sure. great. Wonderful. Um, so the, the thing of this uh, session is about top topic uh, is about technology. So we talk about technology uh, developed by um, BlackRock and used by BlackRock uh, as well. So now uh, I want to uh, switch uh, the gear a little bit by asking um, how BlackRock actually view technology, especially uh, disruptive technology or green technology in your investment strategy. ESG is a, a primary focus uh, for BlackRock right now. Um, we're very committed. Um, you, you, you know, it, uh, our CEO Larry Fink has been in the news recently for the letter that he sent um, to the uh, companies that we invest in about his commitment um, to battling climate change and uh, sustainable investing and making sure that um, these folks that we invest with understand that as well. Um, and it's a huge focus uh, for BlackRock right now. And I can say that. I just attended a call yesterday about how to build uh, models to quality control climate data and, and on real estate in terms of, okay, well, if um, flood flood levels rise, if um, this area is seeded, um, if the temperature rises by X percent of degrees, what's the impact on the property value um, and being able to QC that. And uh, we're very committed to integrating sustainability into our investment decisions because it has to be. How can we have our clients' best interests at heart or make money for our clients if we're not consi considering the sustainability of that asset to, to produce income? Um, so definitely that's uh, very much at the heart of our decision making um, as a firm and we're very committed to increasing its presence in the decision making process. I see. And I, can, I can speak to that a little bit as well. Hope and Professor, kind of thinking about ESG at BlackRock, it's it's across the, the whole realm of BlackRock, from the way we, we act within the office, the building, the buildings we choose to be in, and then there there's the ESG piece of investing. I think there's two lenses there, where there there's the ESG of screening, where you, you're eliminating. Um, well, when they consider something that needs to be screened out, anything from sustainability to global warming to what oil companies to weapons companies, wherever that may be, to then the the different lens of an impact fund. Uh, we'll, by investing in this fund, we're able to measure a type of impact. I know there's a lot of uh, a lot of researchers going into how that those measurements are calculated and reported, but I think there's two different when you're thinking about building a portfolio with an ESG lens. There's there's the lens of making an impact, and there's a lens of filtering out based on the preferred requirement. So uh, and we, as BlackRock, as Hope mentioned, Larry put the the public letter out there and put BlackRock's name on leading the effort in, in that space. Um, I just kind of think about the portfolio management side. There's two different lenses there for ESG, thinking about filtering out and also making a, a long-term impact. I see. I see. Wonderful. Um, I think like uh, uh, green technology sustainability will be the topic for next session as well, right? So I, I, I cannot wait for that. So to hear more about that. Um, I think uh, so far our audience already here uh, 
some great uh, technology and a great opportunity as well. I think uh, it's time for our question from our audience. Our student moderator, David, uh, uh, will collect uh, questions from the audience, right? And share uh, with the panel. Uh, David, uh, do you collect some questions uh, so far? Uh, thank you, uh, Doctor. Uh, yes, I do have a few student questions here. Uh, the very first one uh, is from, excuse me if I uh, mispronounce your name, but from Quentin Shelton. He's asking, do you have any demos of your software that uh, you have available? Ooh, uh, we definitely can't share any demos of our software, although that's a fantastic question to see if you could get a look into it. Um, no, usually people pay for that, uh, but uh, I'm sure I'm sure that I, um, if you participate in the hackathon, um, you might get to see a little bit more of Aladdin. Um, and I can talk with HR and see if there's anything that we can share externally for you. Um, so leave that with me to take away and I'll get back to um, the professor and to David if I can find anything that we'd be allowed to share externally. There's also, um, I'm, I'm not sure how far in the process it is, but I know there's a project to actually create a smaller version of Aladdin specifically for colleges um, that will give an idea of what Aladdin is. I, I know that it's being worked on, but I'm not sure when it will be ready, but hopefully in the future we'll be able to show something like that. I am in fact leading that project. I will let you know. That oh, was... Okay. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> that would be awesome. Thank you. And then um, you have another question uh, from Again, uh, apologies if I uh, mispronounce your name, but Sima is asking, does the BlackRock platform offer portfolio measures for the client? Uh, so for example, if certain investments are made, how does your risk profile vary or how much do they sh uh, should you invest in the given investment considering the return and risk preferences? Absolutely, we would be terrible asset managers if we didn't do that. Um, if we didn't offer the basics of portfolio construction, not to say that your question was basic, but that's a great question. And yes, we do that every single day. Um, so we have some really cool tools in Aladdin and I hope that I can share them with you. I have to check uh, with our like legal team, but yes, we do some really cool portfolio construction things. Um, you can see, uh, you can see, uh, you know, programmatically, we can take a look at all of your investment history, um, like a financial advisor and individual investor could look and say, hey, over time, like based on my asset mix, I've been underweight the European Union, or I've been a little overweight in big tech, um, and I've been taking undue risk in this sector, um, and this is how it's performed all over time, and these have been my top detractors over time. These are my biggest bets that have really paid off. So, yeah, absolutely. Those those tools are there, um, and uh, definitely I would love to make them available to a wider audience, but I am not quite at the point that I can share them with you just yet. I, th so I fun think fact if I can add that, something. Aladdin, oh, go, go for it, Shima. Sorry, sorry, Adam. I was just saying that a fun fact on that, that Aladdin was actually born out of uh, this requirement because our founders actually incurred a huge loss uh, because they were not uh, they they had no data available on their risk exposures at that time, so they incurred a huge loss, and that is why they decided to create a, a tool or a platform that gives us this uh, risk exposures program programmatically, and that is how Aladdin was born. And people asked uh, us to sell Aladdin, and this is why we have BlackRock where it is right now. I would just want to add one thing, which is um, I know we. It was mentioned in the beginning that you know, BlackRock is the biggest uh, asset manager in the world, but just to share actually the scale of it. Um, so we BlackRock has around $7.2 trillion under management. And so all of that is managed on our Aladdin platform, plus then all the assets of, of our clients. So it's tens of trillions of dollars, just to give an idea of when we, when we talk about analyzing portfolios, um, it could the, that portfolio manager might be responsible for tens or hundreds of billions of dollars. Thank you. Um, also, I have a question from Sam who is asking um, how and what Azure products you use. What uh, Asia products? Sorry, what? The Microsoft Azure. 
Oh, sorry. Yeah, Azure, Azure. Sorry, I'm originally from Germany, so I got a little accent. I don't know how to pronounce a few things. The Microsoft the Cloud platform. It's uh, so we've actually so yeah, BlackRock's actually chosen Azure as the official cloud platform, and uh, we've started migrating uh, many of our services over. Um, it will take some time because of our scale, but I mean because of our size, but definitely it, it provides. I think a huge opportunity to us in the future because I mean historically not not just BlackRock any company that's you know of a big size you have legacy technologies and on-site servers etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and now with everything in the cloud I know like for my team I can speak we can it's much easier to like containerize services and servers and and there are a few issues you know this server has a dependency on TensorFlow, but this one doesn't have the right uh, version of Linux. And now that will be a major point for us where we can actually deploy things far quicker in the cloud. Um, so Adam, you mentioned TensorFlow. So uh, how much are you involved uh, or other uh, teams involved in deep learning? Um, I'm not sure like of exact number of teams. Um, I know, I know it is deep learning is used in different parts of the business. I know like on the actual um, equi like equity analysis side, um, it's used uh, like for many things like to, you know, to try and predict like, uh, like the quantitative funds to try and predict um, obviously different points around the share price. Uh, for my team personally, we use it for a lot of like NLP tasks of classifying um, email like the text of emails. That's actually what we use a lot of deep learning for. Um, and I, I know, I, don't, I guess if I could share one thing that I think maybe everyone would, like everyone here might find relevant. Um, I think for me, the, the interesting thing about deep learning is that it's just when you when you deploying a deep learning model into an actual into production, so actually onto a server that a client is using, it's just so different to like developing the model within your Jupyter notebook or however it's done and that's been really interesting for me where actually the modeling part of building a deep learning model is has actually been a much smaller part than getting that model to work sure. on the server yeah which has been um it's it's very interesting it's been an interesting process for sure sure uh, so Adam, uh, another follow-up. So you mentioned that uh, BlackRock actually manage a uh, 7.2 trillion, if I heard correctly, uh, assets, right? Uh, so I just wonder how how Alari leveraged a big data platform like uh, maybe Hadoop or Spark. How how, how is that? So uh, in other words, Alari is built upon Hadoop or uh, some other big data platform. Um, yeah, I mean, we there there are many. We definitely use Hadoop for for many things. I think different parts of the business use different technologies. Hadoop is a is a big player. Um, a lot of, I mean, yeah. There's how do I say it? The size of the assets under management is. I wouldn't say it's directly correlated to the amount of data as in if you manage a trillion dollars worth of assets I don't think you would have that much less data from the actual I see I see investment side of things um, mm -hmm. but I don't know Shima if you know of a few other uses for for the actual database technologies uh, no you're, you're right Adam like uh, 7.2 or 7.8 as of today's news uh, doesn't uh, doesn't actually uh, mean that we have that much amount of data but having said that we do use hadoop and spark uh, as well as sybase as well for our uh, data storage needs i see also there's another student question here from uh, quentin shelton um, so what can uh, somebody do to make uh, the software portfolio stand out a little bit more Is that as as in like a personal project? 
Um, personal projects or um, I would imagine also experience. So maybe this could be a two parter question. So maybe do you have any book recommendations to enhance uh, uh, personal skills to? Uh, yeah, he actually specified for personal projects, but also do you have any recommendations on how to enhance skills to perhaps uh, up the chances of getting hired? I, I mean, I think I think that is the amazing thing about like kind of this the, the software engineering world is that you when you have a job interview it's not theoretical you can actually say like i look i built this and this is what i can do which is is great i think my suggestion for personal project is like don't do what you think will impress someone or whatever do something you're passionate about um because generally like you know if you love baseball and you do a project predicting baseball results or you know something along those lines you probably get much more passionate and much deeper into the into the project than otherwise um so i definitely think passion is important and um i think also what i what i would recommend is don't just take like an existing data set if it's a if it's a data science project or kind of an existing framework and plug a few things together. Um, I think really put in the effort to to either create your own data set or just yeah, do do something. Something has to be a little bit different or unique about it um, rather than just piecing different existing pieces of technology together. Does I would say sense? impact like to con I totally agree with everything that Adam said and like if I was looking at um, some came to me with a project that they had executed that was on their resume, I would say, you know, it, it could be really fancy and you could use some really cool techniques and it's impressive, but like, what did it do? Like, did it actually help you or did it help anyone? Um, I'll, I'll tell you candidly that I love seeing like pro bono or volunteer work based um, on a resume resume because it shows me that you can have a it, anyone can do something fancy and just like put it together and like you know if you have the skills but I think that when you actually have a problem and you can show hey there is a real problem a real life problem either in your personal life or you know at the world at large and I found a way to solve for it that's huge that's going to really speak in a in an interview for sure also, I have a question that kind of goes uh, along the line uh, with the last question. So how much would a CCSE student need to know about finance if they wanted to work for BlackRock? That is a great question. And uh, sorry, Hope, you, you're going to say something. I, I, I would say that if you're being hired as a technologist, you have to absolutely know nothing about finance. Uh, within BlackRock, we provide we are a student of technology and we are a student of finance. So we provide uh, regular curriculum and trainings uh, that like me, I have been with the firm for more than six years, but I am also part of those curriculums and I am attending those trainings now as well. So BlackRock provides you training for the job that you need to perform. You need to come in um, with the right learning attitude as well as, uh, you know, understanding of the basic concepts of what are data structures, what are OOPS concepts and things like that. Even when uh, we do the hiring for interns as well as the uh, grad analysts, we uh, give them a program to write on like a sample test program to write and we give you an option on what is the language that you want to use to write that program. So we are not that dependent on, uh, you know, the, the the language that you want to use. It's more about uh, if what, what do you understand as well as, you know, business problem is something that we can take care of at within the firm. And I have another I, question that kind of goes along with, ah, unless you want to say something. No, I, I would just, Ashwin was completely correct and I would say come being smart and being hardworking and either having the fin or having the tech. We can teach the other. So basically you grow with uh, BlackRock. <laughs> yeah, I I was an economics and international affairs uh, major and I learned all of my tech skills at work and uh, I hired an engineer who had all tech skills and no financial background and together we're pretty well rounded. Wonderful. There's another student question then. Um, so how does BlackRock and or Aladdin stand out when compared to other risk assessment providers like Yahoo Finance or Fidelity? Uh, well, there's not really a comparison with Yahoo Finance. I don't know if I would trust Yahoo Finance 
for anything, but uh, just like, just to get a quote even. Um, but uh, yeah, like other, if we were gonna look at like major competitors, perhaps like Fidelity or Vanguard or in the technology space, like major tech firms would be our biggest competitors. Um, I think that all of these firms have really smart people working there and have a lot to offer, but ultimately I think our size and our agility um, is probably what sets us apart. And also I think our culture, and I know that everyone probably says that and it sounds like really like gimmicky, but definitely like we have flex time off. Uh, it's not just two weeks. When you start at BlackRock, you can take as much vacation as you need, as long as it's approved by your manager. Um, we have like really, really engaged networks. Um, we're all very involved with our community. BlackRock was really involved in Atlanta with getting the Hate Crimes uh, Act passed um, and joined with other local businesses to advocate for that. Um, and, you know, we definitely do some some pretty cool stuff and we have some really great programs to help our employees. And I've definitely gotten to take advantage of them, especially during a crisis like this. Um, just uh, got a, another student question. Um, so are there any benefits for students at BlackRock? Like, for example, tuition assistance or something along the lines? Yeah, so I'm actually taking advantage of that. Um, I'm doing the, uh, the data analytics masters at Georgia Tech. Um, and it's a BlackRock offers a $5,000 um, subsidy uh, for advanced education and will also pay for your CFA if you're interested in getting your CFA. Awesome. Um, and then what kind of training does BlackRock offer to new employees in terms of programming language? Because uh, I mean, you did touch up on that BlackRock does offer quite a bit of training. Uh, do you have like any more specifics? Adam, would you like to take that one or I can take it? Sure. Um, well, I mean, I think at the end of the day, there are a lot of resources available, but it's also up to you, up to the person to actually take advantage and put in the time and, and the effort. Um, we have a lot of resources available, like access to, um, uh, what's it called, Coursera, and um, I've hit a blank on uh, Plural Science. You did really good and Udemy and you know a, a couple of the MOOC uh, courses I think there's so much available online that um it's more about I mean I mean yeah I don't think there's let me rephrase it it's not we don't offer something that's like wow this is unavailable to anybody else but there's a lot of support and um a lot of it is paid for on your behalf and you just have to put on put in the time and the effort um and, and there are also seminars that are available with um, like experts in the fields and of course just the people around you at BlackRock um, you know whatever skill you're looking for you can find someone at BlackRock who can advise you and help you out on it. Oh awesome and um, also um, think, uh, we have time for uh, one more question last question. Yeah last question um, just more also or a personal question because I'm kind of currently looking at what kind of certifications I want to get in order to be more hireable. So first of all, what kind of certifications are you looking for? And second of all, once hired, do you offer any kind of uh, certification training or certifications? Yes, so CFA is the one that I mentioned before, so that's quite a costly one. So it's about $1,000, I think, for the Certified Financial Advisor um, exam, um, and uh, BlackRock does pay for it, um, all three levels. Um, I can't speak to some of the other like technical certifications, but I would say that BlackRock is very good about if you have the skills and you can prove that you have the skills, that's what's most important. Um, and also furthering on, on Adam's comments, we have a whole suite we call it, it's called BlackRock Academies of Python, Perl, whatever kind of training. Um, and we also have paid accounts to Coursera, um, to different um, classes. I've done the Coursera. I've also done our own internal courses that we offer. Um, and there's just tons of resources on team. Um, it's just more like if you have the dedication to make the time for it, then the resources are there for you. Um, but aside from the CFA, I will say I'm not aware of like another certification that's um, subsidized. Uh, for uh, for for hiring specifically, if you're asking, we not we would not 
want to look at someone who has done the certification but doesn't know anything about about it. So we we look at the knowledge piece more instead of what are the number of certifications you write in your resume. That doesn't matter a lot for us. But having said that, after you join BlackRock and you are interested in taking a set of courses, every team uh, gets a certain amount of budget for just for the learning purposes. And uh, as long as it justifies your role and what, what do you need to perform uh, at BlackRock, it will get approved by your manager. So it, it just has to support whatever you are working on right at that moment. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for- Sorry, if I can just- Oh, absolutely. Just something quick, which is also, I think, it's uh, like it's important to say that Black Blackrock is huge. So, you know, different teams might be looking for different things, uh, different skills. Uh, I'm uh, hope. I'm sorry. I'm only saying. I'm only correcting you because in case someone's googling it, uh, CFA is Chartered fin Chartered Financial Analyst. Um, that's what it stands for. Sorry, I was just saying it in case someone's googling it. And as as a general theme. I'm not saying that anybody needs this, but like if you're interested in a cloud technology, then an Azure certification can't it can't hurt. I'm not saying it's necessary. Yeah, and one thing you should also know is it's always good to correct here. Like you should always call someone out if they're wrong, and that is a skill that you should have 100% at BlackRock. So thank you, Adam. I appreciate it. Yeah, I wish uh, our conversation can be continued going on. So just uh, uh, for all the people in the audience, just uh, plan to attend the next session on November 4th. Um, this is a, a truly amazing session, uh, very insightful for me. Uh, I believe for the audience as well. Uh, thank all the panelists for dedicating your time to be with us and uh, sharing your insight on technology and the opportunities. Uh, Dean Preston, now it's all back to you. Thank you, Dr. Xi. Well, I want to say thanks to Ashima, Adam, and Hope. Uh, great, great conversation. If if I can take a, a moment of personal privilege and bring it back to something that we started with about creativity and how important that is, and and the idea of being inquisitive at BlackRock and how that's a very high skill. Um, one last question: Can each of you give us just a, a brief description of what you do to maintain that creativity and that inquisitiveness, whether it's in your professional or personal lives, but just how do you develop that? And I think our students would be really, uh, would benefit from having that insight from you because you're absolutely right. That's such an important skill to have. I think uh, it, it goes back to what Hope said a couple of minutes earlier on, you know, questioning everything and never afraid to ask or, you know, just never afraid to point out that somebody is wrong or if no question is a wrong question. And then I think having that attitude uh, is comes comes a long way uh, at BlackRock. Just being open to question anybody and figuring out why something is working the way it is or why it should work the way it has been working for the last 20 years. I would definitely say that, yeah, continuing on that point, I think you just have to, I would say the thing that I do to try and stay curious is doing something that I'm bad at because doing something I'm bad at is the first step to doing something I'm good at. And uh, I try to just try new things and not being afraid of being wrong or being bad and uh, just surrounding yourself with smart people like Adam and Ashima. It's great when you get corrected because you learn. Um, and just not having that instinctual like fear of that and being able to work in an environment where that's that's a good thing, where it's not hyper competitive and it's collaborative. Um, and I just try and take honestly time off from work. I try and take the time that I need it and I try and try new things in, in my spare time just to keep my mind active. My view is uh, more from like a technology skills point of view is, I mean, it comes back to what we're saying about personal projects. I always try and have a personal project going, even if it's just for the purpose of like learning new things. Um, Cause I think along when you're actually trying to, if you just sit there and you're like, okay, what can I learn or whatever? It's not obvious, but when you're actually trying to achieve something and build something or build something to achieve something, it's like, oh, okay, well, I actually need a front end component to this. And well, I only know Python. Well, let me learn what it would take to build something on the front end. And then it's like, okay, well, I need to host it somewhere. What are my options? Well, maybe I should learn something about the cloud. So I think my advice is don't like sit and think like, oh, what can I learn? Whatever. Rather try and do something and then learn the things that will get you there. 
Fantastic. That's great advice. Thank you for sharing. Well, again, I'd like to thank everybody for being here tonight. Uh, Lucas, Stephen, thank you. Hope, Ashima, and Hope, and, and uh, Adam, thank you for, for your insights. Really, really great to hear from you. And uh, Ying and David, thanks for emceeing and, and keeping everything going with the great questions. Uh, as Dr. G mentioned, I want to remind everyone to pencil in November 4th. 6 p.m. will be our fourth and final of these invited lecture series with BlackRock. The College of Science and Mathematics will be hosting and the topic will be on sustainability, which is, as we've talked about tonight, a very important element of BlackRock's portfolio and management. So again, thanks everybody. Hope you stay safe and healthy and we'll see you on November 4th. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much. This was fun. Thanks everybody.